Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. So we have a small group, so let's make it uh, interactive. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, my name is Neil Trevitt. Uh, I'm VP of Mobile Content at NVIDIA, and I'm the president of the Kronos Group. And welcome to the uh, Kronos debut. So this is the first session of two days of sessions for deep diving into Kronos APIs. And we're going to start each morning today and tomorrow with uh, this API overview and an overview of the new Kite Educator program that uh, Kronos is beginning to, to run. As that will happen at 11 o'clock. And then each day we're going to go into details on the number of APIs. Uh, today we have OpenGL and OpenCL applications, uh, OpenGL SC, uh, visual programming on Android, uh, stream input, and then we have beer <laughs> at 4.30. The beer is most interesting. And uh, all the detailed schedule is in the handouts that you have in your bag. And then tomorrow, after the overviews, we'll do OpenGL ES, OpenSL ES, uh, OpenBG, OpenMax AL, and uh, WebGL, WebCL, and OpenCL. So you're welcome to come and go to any of the sessions that are of interest to you. Um, but now we're in the uh, ecosystem and the overall overview of the work that uh, Kronos is doing. Uh, this will take just over half an hour uh, to give you a high level summary. So the trends that are happening in the industry, uh, still the uh, high-end systems are where uh, cutting-edge technology is being developed. Uh, PCs, supercomputers, workstations, uh, APIs like OpenGL and OpenCL are being used on desktop systems. Uh, but increasingly mobile is a new platform where innovation is happening and we need high performance and harder acceleration to give us low battery uh, consumption. Uh, mobile APIs like OpenGL ES and OpenSL ES for graphics and audio. But increasingly, the mobile devices are being used for innovative applications that use all of the sensors and capabilities of a mobile device. So we need APIs that work well together, not just independently. So we have uh, APIs like EGL and OpenMax that inter interoperate graphics and video. And then finally, as mobile processes become more uh, pervasive, uh, more and more different types of devices be beginning to have visual and media acceleration capability. Uh, it's a potential problem for software developers uh, who need to write once and run in many different places. And the web standards, HTML5, is one possible way where we can provide portable programmability and we have web-based standards such as WebGL and WebCL uh, that are bringing advanced uh, graphics and compute capabilities to HTML5. So we're going to talk very briefly about uh, these APIs and, and how, they, how they fit together. So the Kernels Group is an open standards organization. Uh, we are focused on royalty-free uh, uh, cross-platform open industry API standards for graphics, compute, for audio, for video, um, for sensor hardware. So the APIs that we build are very close to the hardware, close to the silicon or close to the sensors. Um, it means that the APIs we build are useful across many different platforms. So we find the Kronos APIs are getting quite widely deployed. Um, and our mission is to enable the software community to access the power of advanced silicon. We have about 120 members. Um, it's a mixture of the graphics vendors, the OS vendors, platform vendors, um, uh, middleware vendors. So we have a good representation from the industry. Um, it's important because we have a quorum of the requirements of the industry, so we can create the APIs uh, that meet real industry needs. So this is a... Uh, uh, a graph of uh, the most active uh, APIs that Kronos is currently uh, developing. And we can begin to group these APIs into related families. So we have the family of 3D APIs, OpenGL on the desktop, OpenGL ES for mobile, and WebGL for web. We have the parallel computation APIs, OpenCL on the desktop, and WebCL 
for HTML5. And the two um, web APIs interoperate quite closely together. We'll, we'll see how that begins to work later on in the presentation. We have, have EGL, which is a service management API that lets uh, the graphics APIs uh, work well with the native operating system and actually lets the uh, compute and graphics APIs work closely together. We have Collada, which is a one standard that's not an API, it's an open uh, additional asset exchange file format uh, for 3D assets, OpenVG for vector graphics, OpenMax and OpenSLES for video and audio. Stream Input is one of the newest working groups for advanced sensor processing and our very newest working group, which we just announced uh, today, is for computer vision, uh, defining a acceleration API for uh, vision type applications. And altogether, uh, Cornell is working hard to make sure that all these APIs uh, work um, as a compute ecosystem. So let's start with 3D. Uh, we have, obviously, we're here at SIGGRAPH. Uh, everyone's more than aware of the rapid evolution in 3D graphics. We've gone uh, from Doom on a PC all the way through to uh, advanced, highly realistic uh, rendering all on the PC platform. That's largely due to developments in GPUs and the APIs to program them. Uh, OpenGL, as I'm sure you know, is the uh, open standard cross-platform 3D API. Uh, we now have four generations of OpenGL. OpenGL is coming up to its 20th anniversary. And each generation has enabled new types of GPU hardware. So um, OpenGL 1 and 2 uh, focused on uh, the fixed function pipeline and then made it programmable, but focusing primarily on pixel and fragment processing. And then OpenGL 3 and 4 adding things like tessellation uh, really enabling uh, acceleration of the geometry uh, within a scene. OpenGL has been evolving quite rapidly over the last few years. Um, we have now OpenGL 4.2, which was announced at SIGGRAPH in LA in the summer. And we've had one, two, three, four, five, six um, releases of OpenGL uh, since 2008. So the OpenGL family is progressing rapidly, and we are now really ahead of DirectX 11 in many ways for providing advanced graphics functionality. And we have the ecosystem. So OpenGL is great for 3D, but if we want to combine it with uh, compute, parallel computation, uh, then we can uh, bring in OpenCL. OpenCL is an API standard for heterogeneous parallel uh, programming. And we need these APIs to be more than just individual APIs, they need to interoperate. And so OpenCL and OpenGL uh, can have very close levels of an interoperability. We can share data buffers between the two APIs, we can share events between the two APIs, uh, so we can begin to construct very powerful visual computing applications, and some of the uh, presentations uh, this afternoon will be talking about that. The basic idea behind OpenCL is that GPUs and CPUs are becoming more alike. Uh, CPUs are becoming more parallel. We have uh, two, four, eight or more cores now in CPUs, and GPUs that have many hundreds of processors are becoming more programmable. But in the past, you've had to use different frameworks for programming the two. OpenCL is the first framework that you can use to write a single program that can run across any type of compute hardware that you have uh, in your system. So the OpenCL has a number of components. There's a platform layer API for you to query and select the various compute devices that you have. There's a kernel language, which is very similar to ISO C99, for you to write the kernels of um, execution that you want to execute on your um, uh, computing devices. And then there's a runtime API that lets you pass out the kernels, have them execute, and bring back uh, the results. And OpenCL 
uh, has been shipping for a number of years. Uh, OpenCL has an embedded ES specification, so there will never be a need for a separate OpenCL ES. Um, the embedded systems profile is built into uh, the core specification itself. So very soon, you will see full OpenCL implementations uh, on mobile devices, as well as desktop and uh, supercomputers. And just a few weeks ago, in Tokyo, we announced OpenCL 1.2, which is the latest version of the OpenCL specification. Uh, it's quite a lot of significant upgrades. Uh, Kronos has been responsive to developer requests. So we've been listening to the developer community and building those requests into this new version of the specification. Um, there are new uh, performance tests that test all the new functionality, and there are multiple implementations uh, underway. But 1.2 is backwards compatible. So all of the code uh, that you've written for 1.0 and 1.1 uh, that investment will be uh, protected, and we do maintain the embedded profile uh, in OpenCL. So I expect that the first mobile implementations of OpenCL will probably be OpenCL 1.2. Looking forward, there's a lot of activity around OpenCL. Um, now we've completed 1.2, we're looking at the roadmap for the core specification. Uh, looking to enhance the memory and execution models uh, in OpenCL to provide more uh, par par parallel programming flexibility and uh, more expressiveness to the programmer. And, but we're looking downwards in the stack. We're looking to create a intermediate representation, a lower level uh, of representation of uh, OpenCL programs so you can distribute uh, programs without needing to distribute the source. And by providing a low-level intermediate representation, we can provide a target for alternative high-level languages to OpenCLC. We're also looking up in the stack and looking to explore more programming flexibility with syntax-level standards and uh, looking to unify the host and device execution so people can write a very simple program, very simple uh, syntax extensions to give a lot of flexibility as to how a parallel program will execute on compute resources. A lot of the innovation, as we said, is happening now in the mobile space. And I think we'll look back and we'll say uh, the first decade of the of 2000 was the internet revolution, but now we're living through the mobile revolution where people are doing more and more of their computing on their mobile devices, not their desktop PCs. And in fact, things are moving really, really fast. If you plot how long it took for the PC platform to reach 100 million units per year um, and versus how long it's taken uh, just uh, iOS and Android smartphones to reach 100 million units per year. Uh, it took around 23 years for PCs. It took just three years for smartphones. So things are moving a lot faster uh, this time around than they did uh, with the PC uh, revolution. And if you look at the current state-of-the-art mobile silicon, uh, already there's a lot of hardware and uh, graphics and compute capability built into mobile silicon to enable developers to create really rich experiences. As well as dual core or quad core CPUs, we now have advanced GPUs, we have high definition encode and decode video, we have advanced camera processors, advanced audio processors, and these are all packed into a single device that runs on just a few hundred milliwatts. This, that's the basic uh, technology that's enabling the mobile revolution. And we've just started. This is a roadmap for my own company, so I'm allowed to show it. Looking forward, the different generations, every year we're going to find that mobile silicon increases in performance and functionality. Uh, in this roadmap, for example, we're going from today's devices into 2014, about four or five years, 
75 times, 50 to 75 times more performance over just the next few years. And so it's going to be a tremendous challenge, but also a fantastic opportunity for the software development community to create applications that can take advantage of that level of performance uh, sitting in the palm of your hand. And if we're going to enable developers to reach into that silicon, uh, we need the right APIs, which is why the mobile APIs are some of the most important um, specifications that Kronos develops. The best known mobile API is OpenGL ES, which is a subset of the uh, desktop OpenGL. It provides advanced 3D processing in a very streamlined, lightweight API. And we operate uh, OpenGL ES and OpenCL. So we can now use OpenCL and OpenGL ES on mobile devices and create visual computing applications on mobile. OpenGL ES, uh, if you're not familiar, um, is based on uh, OpenGL uh, 2.0. Uh, it's a fully programmable uh, pipeline um, and it's capable though of running advanced engines such as gaming engines, uh, uh, UE3 uh, from Unity, um, at UE3 from Unreal, the Unity engine, advanced uh, games, very immersive environments are quite possible uh, shipping today uh, using OpenGL ES. OpenGL ES 2.0 is the latest version of the API and it's fully programmable. The, uh, the vertex processing and the fragment processing in OpenGL ES2 uh, uses shaders. We've removed the fixed function pipeline that was for transform and lighting and the pixel processing in OpenGL ES 1.0. All of today's smartphones are now shipping with OpenGL ES2. Uh, ES2 is the is a sweet spot for today's mobile 3D graphics application development. And we have a session on OpenGL ES uh, tomorrow morning. But OpenGL ES is just the first step in bringing advanced visual and graphics processing onto mobile. We want to be able to use the full power of the mobile silicon to create forward-looking applications like augmented reality, which is uh, a demanding application because many different parts of the system have to come together and work together seamlessly. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen augmented reality applications. The basic idea is that you have a mobile device with a camera and you bring in the camera video stream, you process it and you track objects in the video stream and then you synchronize 3D objects over that scene, that real world scene, down to the pixel level. So you can create the illusion of 3D augmentations being overlaid and inset into the real world scene. You can use those augmentations for entertainment, for more information about your environment. But there's a lot of processing that needs to go on. If you look at the processing flow, you need to bring in the camera, you need to do low level camera and video processing close to the sensor. You need to send that video stream to the computer vision software, which is doing the tracking. Um, typically today that's done mainly on the CPU. You need to bring in the other sensors, the gyro, the accelerometers, GPS, um, the, um, uh, how high you are, uh, and bring all of those uh, sensors in together with the uh, tracking that you're doing through the camera. Create semantic information for the application. The application needs to know precisely where it's pointing and where it is in relationship to the real world. And the application then uses that information to create the augmentations. The augmentations get overlaid over the video stream. So you need to send the video stream to the GPU for that composition process. Uh, you need to then combine the video and the graphics together for the visual display. And then typically also you have audio, so you need to do audio rendering uh, and send that to the output display too. So a lot of processing. It's quite demanding to do this all in a mobile device. And we want to do it in using open standards so we can create portable 
augmented reality type applications. So what are the API standards in our world that we have for creating this kind of application today? Well, we have OpenGL ES, that's the easy part uh, for the 3D graphics. We have OpenSL ES, which is, uh, as OpenGL ES is to graphics, OpenSL ES is to sound, so audio processing, including 3, 3D spatial audio processing, is made available through OpenSL ES. The camera processing and low-level video processing is through OpenMax AL. We have the EGL standard that lets you manage surfaces so you can seamlessly pass video from the video subsystem to the 3D graphics GPU. We have some new standards called uh, OpenCV and OpenCL, uh, which you can use for doing the uh, image processing. And Stream Input, which is the sensor processing uh, API. So we have all the pieces for the first time are covered using open standards. So let's dive into a little more detail on some of these APIs that we haven't mentioned yet. OpenSLES is, is easy to understand. As I say, OpenSLES is for audio or sound, uh, and it does for audio what OpenGLES does for graphics. It's an object-oriented uh, API, so it's simple to use code is very portable um, and you can use the same API whether you're using a software audio engine or a hardware audio engine. So your portability um, is across different platforms with different audio uh, implementations. And again, there's a session on open SLES if you want more, more details. The key thing though to understand about open SLES is that there are three different profiles. There's the basic phone profile, there's the music profile that gives you better quality, and better mixing, and then the full game profile, which gives you full 3D positional audio. Most OpenSLES devices today are shipping with the full uh, gaming profile, so you get uh, a lot of advanced audio functionality. There's a sister API to OpenSLES, it's called OpenMax AL. Uh, OpenMax AL is to enable key camera, image, and video acceleration and use cases. And OpenMax AL is also object oriented. In fact, it's the same basic API as OpenSL ES. And OpenMax AL uh, enables a number of interesting use cases that are being worked on by many people in the industry right now uh, advanced image capture and computational photography. Uh, you can do HD uh, content playback with DRM. Uh, you can do HD video teleconferencing. You can do parallel processing both of the camera uh, and received uh, video and augmented reality, like we've discussed. So, in concept, OpenMax AL is very simple. It's object oriented. So, you get a media object where you do your processing. And you can attach a number of different sources, and you can attach a number of different sinks. And the sources in the sinks have controls. So, for example, if you have a camera input source, uh, you can control a lot of different things about the, the camera. Uh, the, the exposure, the frame rate, um, the uh, region of interest, uh, the sensor processing type, uh, a lot of advanced functionality for controlling the camera is made available through OpenMax AL. And then the number of different sinks. Uh, one of the most interesting sinks for augmented reality applications is you can send uh, the video stream out to the GPU through EGL. And we'll talk about that uh, in a second. The nice thing from the programmer's point of view is that openness yes and OpenMax AL, uh, they use the same object framework. So really, if you're just using two different halves of the same API uh, for audio and for multimedia processing. In fact, there's a, an overlap in the middle uh, for uh, basic audio, and it's the same API you use uh, for both directions. So it's one, one API to learn. EGL. So EGL is this API that's often forgotten, uh, but it's actually one of the most important. 
if we're trying to get the APIs to work together. Um, EGL is a buffer management API. And one of the key use cases is to get the video stream to be sent to the GPU in a very efficient way with no conversions, no copies, not involving the CPU at all. Uh, EGL makes that possible. And we actually have just released a new extension to EGL called EGL Stream, which makes things even easier. It's uh, a connection between sources and sinks, uh, but it hides the details of sending a stream of images from the source to the sink underneath the API, so the hardware vendor will implement a lot of the complex processing uh, the developer just gets a very simple API to use. So you can, for example, set up OpenMax AL as the producer of a stream. You can set up um, an external texture in OpenGL ES as uh, the sync for, for the stream. And an external texture in OpenGL ES will automatically uh, perform any format conversions that are necessary in the hardware, uh, so you, for example, if you have a YUV video stream, you can automatically convert that to uh, RGB OpenGL ES textures. And then the EGL stream API in the middle uh, lets you set up the different buffering modes in a very simple way uh, to connect the video uh, to the graphics. So, for example, you can have the transfer as a straight FIFO or uh, so the, the uh, sync will just get the last uh, video frame that's available. Or you can explicitly latch and release each frame. So you can say, I want to process at every frame, uh, and I'll tell you that I'm finished with each frame. Uh, a number of different modes that you can use uh, through the EGL Stream API uh, to suit your particular um, application. But it's been defined in a way that the hardware vendors can make sure that this interoperability uh, happens in a very efficient, um, hardware-friendly way. Uh, question. Yes. Uh, for the video, the UAD most of the time is upsampled. Mm? Uh, so it will really take care of the upsampling of the uh, Yes, the that's right. The GLA texture external extension well, will, well, you will be able to query what um, subsampled uh, formats are able to be converted, but yes, you're right. So obviously, the subsampling is, is normally a part of the video stream, so many implementations of the GL texture external will, will do that conversion for you. And most of the GL texture requires the size of the power of 2, so it doesn't have to follow that, or...? It doesn't have to follow that anymore. So yeah, power of 2 uh, is no longer a limitation in most GPUs out there. I agree, that's important too. So, Stream Input is uh, a new API from uh, Kronos. Uh, we don't have a logo yet, it's so new. And it's uh, come from the fact that these mobile devices are now packed with different types of sensors. Touch screens, uh, mechanical input devices, uh, um, inertial sensors, positional sensors, GPS uh, sensors, pressure sensors, and Applications want to create compelling experiences that use those sensors, um, but they can't afford to write different sensor code for every model of phone uh, that uh, is shipped. Uh, typically, you have to write code that's quite specific uh, to the sensors on a particular device. That's the problem that Stream Input is designed to solve. So the way we do that is uh, defining uh, semantic information that the application can request uh, from the sensors on the device. So for an augmented reality application, that semantic information can be well, where am I and where am I pointing relative to the scene so I can do my augmentation tracking. But it can be virtual sensors too. For example, you can define a virtual sensor that will tell the application if the device is in an elevator and um, going up and down, or in a car being driven at over a certain speed, or is it being carried in a hip pocket or being carried in a backpack, um, you can actually tell 
uh, from the sensors on a device, uh, whether the device is in similar situations. So the way that the True Input API creates that semantic information is to take the input devices that are available, create a filter graph, um, processing the various sensors to create the semantic uh, information. It's very important, if you talk to the sensor vendors, it's important that we don't force the application vendors to have to, to program the individual devices. Um, you can do a lot of sensor fusion, sensor fusion processing if you know the characteristics of the different sensors in a device and combine them together in uh, sophisticated ways. Stream input, because we're defining the semantic information to flow back, we enable innovation at the sensor hardware level. We enable the sensor hardware vendors to perform the fusion processing uh, using their intimate knowledge of the sensor hardware and provide high quality semantic data stream back to the application. We're also solving a important problem which has, hasn't been addressed before, which is how do you synchronize multiple sensor types? So again, augmented reality is a great use case. You're using your inertial sensors, your gyro, and the camera, and the delays through the processing streams from the uh, gyro and the camera are different depths. So if you don't know how those two sensors relate to each other in time, it can be very difficult to create a high quality or mental reality experience. So Stream Input is defining universal timestamps. So you will timestamp every sensor as it comes into the Stream Input API that will enable the application to be able to adjust the timing uh, as it processes multiple sensor types so for the first time, you'll be able to create applications with synchronized sensor processing. We have a number of companies that are working on uh, stream inputs. Some of the more, most interesting ones, PrimeSense. They're the company that created the technology behind the Kinect. Um, so depth cameras like the Kinect uh, are one sensor type that we're going to be uh, handling with stream input. And uh, soft kinetic are there too, they also have depth camera technology. Uh, PrimeSense have contributed OpenNI, which is their proprietary API for controlling depth cameras. We're going to be integrating some of the concepts in OpenNI into the larger standard, which is uh, Stream Input. So it's a very interesting and exciting area. As I say, we announced one working group today, the press release went out this morning. Uh, which is a computer vision working group. This one's so new we don't even have the name of the API yet. Um, but the idea is that we will create a hardware acceleration layer for computer vision type processing. There are uh, open source vision libraries in the industry, such as OpenCV, it's a very well known computer vision open source project. Um, but it's just a body of open source. And it doesn't use acceleration typically. It's just uh, software that runs on CPU normally. Um, there's no API in OpenCV to actually tap down into silicon acceleration and to enable hardware vendors to create accelerated libraries of uh, vision um, functionality. So that's the problem that the computer vision working group at Kronos will be uh, addressing, creating a hardware-friendly uh, acceleration layer with a primary focus on mobile devices and enabling acceleration of vision type uh, algorithms on GPUs, CPUs, DSPs and you know, other types of processor hardware. The name we're calling at the moment CV Hell, C Computer Vision Hardware Acceleration Layer, that's just a placeholder name to decide what exact scope we're going to be uh, covering, and therefore, what should we call uh, the API. So, watch this space for when we come up with, uh, with the name.
Sorry. Yes. Does Qualcomm have some kind of like a computer vision library as well? Yes, that's right. That's so is it part of it or is it separate? Yes, so that's a great uh, example. So uh, it's called FastCV, is the low level API that Qualcomm have defined uh, for their chipset, which is at this kind of level. Uh, but actually, what we're finding is because people need computer vision, there are lots of the silicon vendors beginning to define their own proprietary APIs. And of course, this creates a fragmentation for the software developer. So, um, many of the silicon vendors in Kronos, including Qualcomm, have agreed that we need a cross platform standard, and they have agreed that they will contribute FastCV as one input into this process. And I expect other silicon vendors will do the same thing too. So we'll do the normal thing that we do at Kronos, is drive consensus for what the cross-platform uh, API should be. So it's interesting how the different uh, APIs uh, can be used for an, uh, a use case such as computer vision. Um, we have these different um, API standards, but the nice thing is they can begin to fit together in a really nice stack. So we have OpenCL, which is the lowest layer direct access into the hardware for parallel processing. We could use OpenCL to implement the CVL API. We don't have to, it's not mandated to use OpenCL, but OpenCL would certainly be one possible way to implement uh, the CVL. A higher level open source computer vision library like OpenCV could certainly use CVL uh, to gain access to acceleration. And when you have a nice uh, computer vision library that has things like face recognition, uh, feature tracking, you can use that to implement a stream input node to condense all that vision processing into a semantic packet that you provide to the application in a portable way. And of course, all of these APIs interoperate with OpenGL and OpenGLES for the display part of an application. So we have these APIs, and I say this is a very high level overview. There are sessions over the next day or two with more detail, which I welcome you to come to if you're interested in more detail on some of these APIs. But in general, how are these APIs getting out there into the industry? There's no point developing these specifications if they don't get used and you can't access them. Uh, Android is one interesting platform for helping APIs get out into uh, the market. Android is an open platform, so we can extend the native development environment, the NDK on, on Android, with these um, uh, new APIs. And because they're open standards, many different software vendors can provide them on Android. And hopefully, uh, Google might even consider adopting them into the Android platform itself. And actually, we're actually making pretty good progress on that. If you look at the APIs that we have, OpenGLES uh, 2 has been shipping on Android since Android 2.2. OpenSLES for audio has been shipping on Android since Android 2.3. Uh, in the latest Android uh, ICS, uh, Android 4, uh, includes OpenMax AL. Uh, EGL has been shipping underneath the APIs for some time. I think Google are making progress to exposing that more directly to the application developers. We don't have OpenCL stream input or the computer vision uh, libraries yet, but they're not much newer. So we're working with Google, hopefully uh, we can make them part of the uh, Android platform going forward. But of course there are many different platforms, many different devices. Um, we want to enable uh, developers to write portable code. One interesting um, standard framework that could well enable this is HTML5. We, we've learned that platform vendors sometimes don't like cross-platform uh, code development. Um, they don't like their applications being able to be portably uh, executable across different OSs. Um, so in some places there is a, a resistance to making uh, applications completely portable. Uh, but the good news is HTML5 is already part of most of the commercial platforms that matter. 
But if HTML5 is going to be a cross-platform development environment, it's got to be much more than just more HTML, more page, web page layout. It's got to begin to expose all of this rich functionality that we've been talking about, multi-core CPUs, rich GPUs, uh, parallel computation, image and vision processing, video encode, decode, camera control. How is the web community going to quickly assimilate this diverse functionality? Well, we hope that the native API community and the web API community can begin to work together. The native community in Kronos already has APIs that address lots of these different application areas. Uh, we can expose those capabilities into the web uh, through creating, for example, JavaScript bindings. We've done that with WebGL, which I'll talk about in a second. We now have WebCL, which is a JavaScript binding into OpenCL. We're working with a group in W3C uh, that's defining web audio. We're making sure that we can use Open Max to accelerate uh, that audio functionality. And then perhaps in the future, there are other op opportunities for collaboration uh, using bindings into Open Max or advanced camera functionality, um, bindings into stream input for advanced sensor functionality are things that we are now discussing between Kronos and W3C. So now we're beginning to expand our visual computing ecosystem into the web. WebGL is a JavaScript binding into OpenGL ES, and it's already become a pretty full member of the OpenGL family. It's beginning to drive requirements back into OpenGL and OpenGL ES for things like security, for example. WebGL is kind of a historic opportunity to bring 3D graphics into the web browser without um, a plugin. It's because we have developments from two sides. From the native API side, we have, now have pervasive 3D acceleration. OpenGL ES, or OpenGL, is available pretty much everywhere where the system is browser capable. And from the browser side, we now have very high performance JavaScript, and it's increasing all the time. And we have the canvas tag inside HTML5, which gives us pixel-level writing capability for the first time. So a JavaScript binding to OpenGL ES2 gives us a 3D context, essentially, for the canvas. The way that OpenGL, uh, sorry, WebGL is implemented, we build on the drivers that are in the system, OpenGL, OpenGL ES, or if the system prefers DX9, we have an open source implementation of OpenGL ES 2.0 over uh, DX9. It's called the Angle project, which is initiated by Google. Then the browser vendor implements the WebGL engine. The browser has become a 3D runtime engine uh, itself. And the WebGL engine sits alongside the other browser components, such as the HTML layout engine, the JavaScript interpreter, the CSS layout engine and the content gets downloaded from the web, the content provider can call to WebGL directly, or you can use uh, one of an increasing number of JavaScript middleware packages that give you a much higher level uh, interface. The nice thing about WebGL in the browser, it's, it's 3D that's not trapped in a rectangular window. Um, it's an intimate part of the HTML stack. So WebGL can use the canvas as a texture, can use a video frame as texture. Uh, Google and Mozilla are experimenting to take a subtree of the DOM, so a working web page, and use that as a WebGL texture. So you can begin to have web pages, uh, which are pages in a 3D book, for example, and the pages are still fully uh, functional, all the links uh, still work. So I think you're going to see a lot of innovation in advanced user interfaces that begin to combine 2D uh, and 3D. And I don't know if you see, people have seen a couple of demos. So this is, this is one uh, nice demo, which is uh, WebGL Water. So this is, this is a web page, and this is running uh, in, in the browser. Uh, but it's, it's more than just uh, a normal web page. 
it's an interactive 3D model. Uh, you can you know, interact with water. You can turn off gravity. And this is just running uh, you know, in the standard browser. So you know, there's a lot of computation going on here. Uh, the author is using both WebGL for uh, graphics rendering, but also to do GP, GPU type compute. Another uh, production piece of software um, using WebGL is uh, Google Maps. This is the real Google Maps, not, not a prototype Google Maps. This is the real thing of the Google website. So if you uh, zoom into a uh, Maps GL enabled site, and this is one example of Colosseum in Rome, um, and this is a normal view that you get, it's kind of flat. When you zoom in enough, suddenly it converts into a 3D view. Uh, this is using WebGL, and you zoom far enough, you get this extra control, so you can begin to uh, interact and view these 3D objects uh, in a very you know, interactive way. So WebGL is not ex no, experimental anymore, it's actually being deployed out there in, in real applications. Next step is WebCL, which is parallel computation for the web. So Kronos announced the WebCL initiative back in March 2001. It's a JavaScript binding to, to OpenCL, so all of the parallel computation flexibility you have with OpenCL now comes to the web. It's a very low-level API, and sometimes you think, wow, it's too low-level for a web, but the web community have asked for this low-level API. It lets them build middleware on top of the hardware acceleration. Some of the use cases you'll find, I think, are physics engines, uh, that will drive WebGL applications, image and video editing uh, in browser to making full use of the GPU. WebGL, no caution, it is under construction. Uh, it's not shipping yet in any browsers. The browser vendors are participating and we hope they will ship, uh, but we need, to, we need to be careful not to overpromise because we need the browser vendors to ship for it to be, uh, to be useful. Uh, so we have now WebCL joining this visual computing ecosystem. Uh, it's a binding to OpenCL, a very close companion to, to WebGL. I have a video, which is a kind of demo of what WebGL is going to bring. So this is a WebGL application. This is on a prototype WebCL implementation from Samsung. So this is a simple WebGL application with two spheres in a, uh, a, a virtual environment. But now we turn on a lot of computation. We're deforming those spheres into blobs um, in real time. All, here all the computation is happening in JavaScript. Uh, There's so lots of floating points, and you see the frame rate drops down to just one or two frames a second. We then take that JavaScript computation and put it back on the GPU with WebCL, and the fr frame rate goes 100 times faster, over 100 frames a second. Uh, so you can see the rendering of WebGL and the processing capability of WebCL together are going to enable an extremely compelling real-time uh, web browser-based applications using HTML5. So the final goal we really want to get to is to enable our killer use case of augmented reality in the web. Well, we're not, we're not there yet. Uh, we have gaps, uh, but we're making progress. For the 3D rendering, obviously we have WebGL. For the vision tracking, we could use WebCL. Uh, but we still, and we have EGL that's been increasingly used by the browser vendors to do their composition uh, in the browser stack. But we don't yet have uh, sufficiently advanced camera control in the browser. We don't have uh, sensor fusion with synchronized sensors in the browser. And uh, we're probably going to need more advanced composition the current stack uh, gives us. So, still work to do. That's next next year's uh, project that we'll be uh, working on at, at Kronos and at W3C. So that's the, the end of this overview presentation. Just to summarize, um, we're at Kronos developing acceleration APIs to enable compelling applications on advanced hardware. Uh, 
accessing compute, accessing graphics, audio, video, sensor hardware. But these APIs are no longer just existing in isolation. They're beginning to work together to enable advanced applications uh, like augmented reality. And no longer are these APIs just in the native space. We're beginning to work with the web community to bring these API capabilities into HTML5. But uh, the last thing is uh, Kronos is an uh, open organization. Any company is welcome to join uh, the Kronos group if you want to have a voice uh, and an influence as to how these open standards uh, evolve and develop. Uh, you will be most welcome uh, to join. Uh, we, we would love to have your participation. Thank you very much. Any, any questions? What's the relationship between web audio and SLPs? So, that's a good question. So, web audio um, has been designed independently of OpenSLES. Um, there are actually discussions ongoing whether we should actually have a closer relationship. But at the moment, the web audio proposal um, is an independent API. Um, but it's not yet decided. That discussion is still ongoing. The minimum we're aiming for now is um, to make sure that the web audio API can be accelerated by either OpenSLES or OpenMax AR. Um, so I think that would be the minimum that we can achieve. Uh, there is a possibility that the APIs might get closer together before web audio is finalized. <laughs>